That's a little bit better. I can find my headset. Mel, you could hear me? All right, I got the thumbs up. We're good to go, Bear. I got the thumbs up from Bear. Perfect. Well, church, I just want to say welcome. What a pleasure it is to be here today. And for those of you that join us online, I want to welcome you also. And I truly thank the Lord that we have technology and that He could take His message and He could reach those who cannot be here today. So that is a praise. Now we all know, it's clearly evident, that we live in a world that is constantly changing. I mean, if you think about it, even the words that you used growing up are not the same as today. Words that used to be simple now bear a completely different meaning. And words said today can even be offensive to people. In a world that's constantly changing, and not for the better at all, it is truly a blessing to know the truths of God's Word. Truths found in His Scriptures in verses like Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8 that tells us Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And while, yes, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever, truthfully, we are not any wiser than the disciples were, are we? In Luke chapter 8, verse 25, it tells us that the disciples were terrified and amazed, and they asked each other, Who is this man? When he gives a command, even the wind and the waves obey him. Listen, church, these are the disciples. They were walking with Jesus, eating with Jesus, being taught directly by Jesus. And if they didn't even know who Jesus fully is, how can we say we do also? I mean, yes, we can say that we know that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But do we really know who He is? Listen, I've heard spouses, spouses say after 50 years of marriage, I guess I never knew who they really were. Parents speaking about the kids that they raised from birth sometimes say the same thing. And unfortunately, often Christians say the same thing about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As we heard the singer of the song say, I could spend a thousand years and only start to know your ways. I could write a thousand songs and never capture heaven's love. The truth is, yes, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And in this lifetime, we're never going to know what that truly means. We'll never truly know and understand this Jesus that commands and even the winds and waves obey Him. And despite the fact that, that we could spend a thousand years or even more trying to know Him and we'll never fully know Him, that doesn't mean that we don't try to get to know who He is, does it? Not at all. If you remember, we were created by God to be known by God and for us to know who God is. And Jesus already knows more about ourselves than we even know. So that means all that's left for us to do is get to know Him. So today, we're going to be starting to look at who is this man? Who is this man that when he gives a command, even the winds and the waves obey him? Now just so you know, Jesus, can be, Jesus Christ can be found throughout the entire Bible. Before the foundations of the earth were even laid, Jesus was in heaven with his Father. God tells us that in John chapter 1. He says, In the beginning was the Word. 
And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. That light shines in the darkness, and the darkness not, has not overcome it. And that Word, Jesus, became flesh and made His dwelling among us. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, we're told, For it is God Himself who made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Amen, brother. So today we're going to be looking at Christ's life here on earth in a chronological order. Because after all, Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. And you might be thinking to yourself, what is there about Jesus that I don't know? And I don't mean that in a derogatory way at all. But when looking into the life of Jesus in, an in, in the eventful order, I found there are roughly almost 223 accounts of Jesus' life here on earth. From the time He was born in the manger until the time He ascended into heaven with His Father. Between the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there are roughly 223 different singular events of Jesus' life recorded here on earth. And I'm not talking about crossover events from the four Gospels. These are singular events. 223 from us to learn from. And let me ask you, because I asked myself this question. Out of those 223 events, how many of them can you name off? How many are hidden in your heart? Because when I asked myself that question and I started writing it down... I was disgusted with myself. Now I was almost going to read off all these events to you today, but then I realized that would take almost 30 minutes itself to do so. But if you stop and think about it, we know there's the birth of Jesus, there's Jesus' baptism, His temptation, His teachings on fasting. We also know that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. But did you also know that he raised Jairus' daughter from the dead and a widow's son. The point I'm trying to make is there's so much more to this man that we don't know. So together we're going to learn a little bit more about our Lord and Savior. Because after all, as Paul said, I came to preach Christ crucified and nothing else. And just so you know, Crucified is not just His death on the cross, but it's His whole life here on earth. Christ crucified Himself when He came to earth in the flesh and when He did not consider equality with God something to be used to His own advantage. Remember, the Bible says, rather He made Himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. So if you're listening online and you're sitting here today, for the next few weeks we're going to look at the life of our Lord and Savior here on earth. Now for today, we're going to be looking at four different accounts of Jesus' life here on earth. The four accounts are found in Luke chapter 2. We're going to be looking at the birth of Jesus, the shepherds coming to see Him, the naming of Jesus, and Jesus being presented at the temple. Now we could find the account of Jesus' birth in Luke chapter 2, verses 6 through 7. It tells us, So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for him in the inn. 
Listen, church, we know there's a time and place for everything, right? And it's only in God's perfect timing do we ever find what is good for us. Now, it might not necessarily be what we consider good, but what God has always given us is good enough. And it's definitely way more than we ever deserved. The question we really have to ask ourselves is what, is what God gave to me good enough? You see, for God's actual son, for his real son, not his adopted children, but for his real son, he was given a filthy manger to be born in. Because there was no room for him in the inn. You ever stop and think about that? You know, one thing I noticed in life is at some point in life, all children come to the understanding of life isn't fair. Right? They usually complain. That's not fair, Dad. Or Mom. And we reply with, well, life isn't fair. Right? And I say that's absolutely true. Life isn't fair. It's not fair. But not because of God's doing. Life isn't fair because we as humans allow sin to corrupt life. I mean, the fact that there was no room for them in the inn shows us how unfair Mary was treated. I mean, think about it. This is a woman that was about to go into labor and none of the guests at the inn nor the innkeeper himself offered this pregnant woman a room so she could deliver her child. Listen, you want to cry about how life's not fair? And how you had a rough start growing up? Tell it to Jesus, who was born in a stinking manger because there was no room for him anywhere else. I mean, think about that. The ruler of the heavens, the one who created this earth, that came to this earth to save us from our sins, had no room for him here on earth. You ever feel like that, church? You ever feel like you don't belong? Like you're an outcast in life and nobody wants you? There's a reason for that. And that is because this world and the things of this world do not care about you at all. Jesus, coming into this world, was not offered hospitality. He was not treated fairly. And nobody gave up anything for Him. If anything, if anything, all they gave Jesus was a stinking stable that cost the innkeeper nothing for putting Him there. Yes, lots of us had horrible starts to life. And you might be an outcast that does, this world does not appreciate. But know the truth that you are absolutely so worth, worth so much to God that at just the right time, God sent His one and only Son to die for us on a cross. For you. So that your sins can be forgiven so that you might have a chance, so you might have a chance at being restored and having a relationship with God. And if that is not as comforting as comforting is to a newborn baby wrapped in swaddling cloths, then I don't know what else is. I mean, as loving parents, we still swaddle our children today. And there's a whole idea behind it. The whole idea behind swaddling is it helps the baby transition from the mother's womb, which is a very snug and safe place, to this cold and cruel world. Yes, this outside world hates us. And it wants to kill us, as we're going to hear about that next week. But nonetheless, we can rest assured that we are swaddled in the arms of God. And that goes for even the oldest ones of you here. 
as God told, amen, brother, as God told us in Isaiah chapter 46, 4, even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he. I am he who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. Listen, life in this world has nothing for us. But life through Christ gives us everything. Just as Mary and Joseph both loved that child that they didn't ask for. God loves all mankind whether you ask Him to or not. As Jesus' parents had tender, loving care for Him, so does our Father have for us, and abundantly more. And for us, children of God, we can be comforted just like Christ was comforted knowing that God swaddles us in His arms through this life and into the next. Yes, as awful as they were treated by this world, we too will be. But remember that God always has a place for us. We just have to ask ourselves, is the place God gave me today good enough? And the truth is, the answer will always be, yes, it is. And even when we disagree with God, And we say, no, it's not good, God. Nonetheless, we still look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And when we do, and we look at Him, and we remember that He did not consider equality with God to to be something used to His own advantage, then we could look back at the question and say, yes, this is good enough. Listen, church, I don't care if it's a stinking manger full of animal dung. If God gave it to you, we should know by now we need to rejoice, pray, and give thanks to God. Because we know all good gifts come from our Father who's in heaven. I mean, you think about it. Jesus Christ, the one who the whole Bible is written about, and the one who our faith is founded on, got a stinking manger to start off with. And I say praise God for his testimony, because it's a great example, and it reminds us that despite the fact that this world is evil, and it doesn't care about you one bit, God will always give us what we need as He Himself swaddles us with His love, mercy, and compassion. And He always carries us in His arms. Now that's not all that happened that night, is it? As I said, we're going to be looking at the shepherds coming to Jesus also which is found in verses 8 through 20, tells us that night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, in the city of David. And you will recognize Him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in the manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. 
Let's see this thing that happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what happened and what the angels said to them about this child. And all who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Now there's a lot of sermons in that passage of Scripture. But for us today... The one thing we must take from this today is, when God says go, we must go before it's too late. I love how they went straight from the angel leaving to them going. I mean, just imagine if the, decide, the, the, the shepherds decided, let's take care of a few things first, and then we'll go see what this is all about. After all, it is a work day. And we got bills to pay. They would have missed Jesus completely. They would have missed him completely and they would have had no testimony to tell others about. Listen, church, I know it's scary sometimes following God. Especially when he says, go. And that's all he says. When Pastor Clark asked me to be in his mentoring class... I had no idea how I'd ever live up to the demands that he had for us. We would walk into class, and he would hand us a piece of paper with just one word on it. And he said, you have five minutes to give me a 15-minute sermon. Go. And when pastor became sick, and he asked me to fill in for him from time to time, I thought to myself, How? When he passed away and God allowed me to continue to be at his pulpit, I thought to myself, how God? How am I supposed to do this? How am I supposed to come up with a sermon week after week? And the interesting thing is I found all I have to do is live the life that God wants for me in the here and now. And then he gives me the message as I live for Him. Amen. But imagine if I said, imagine if I said, God, I'm not living for you this week. I'm going to take some time off of this walk with you, but I'll be back in a week. The only sermon I'd be able to come here and preach is the sermon about the prodigal son or about Peter's reinstatement. The truth is, the matter of the fact is, when God speaks to us, we need to act right away. We need not to get our affairs in order, wait for our health to get better, or just wait for a better time. When God speaks to you, go right away. And when you do, God will give you a testimony that astonishes anyone who hears it, and that you'll go back to your flocks with glorifying and praising God for all that you have heard and seen. I mean, Joanne, is that not true? Is that not true? God told her to bring her, her, the children and her family to Awana here many years ago. That was less than a decade ago, right? Yeah, it was less than a decade ago. And just last week, you yourself, you yourself were in this baptistry baptizing your own grandchildren. If that's not a testimony that astonishes anyone, I don't know what else is. She heard God tell her, bring your kids to this program called the WANA. And she came. And she stayed ever since. And now she's baptizing her grandchildren. Where's the amens? Amens for that. I mean, do you see what God says? Go when I tell you to go, and I will give you a testimony that astonishes everyone. And not only that, you'll get to go back to your flock, 
glorifying and praising God for all that you have seen and done. I mean, how beautiful is that? What a testimony that is. Her testimony is a truth to the testimony of God's Word. I mean, could you imagine? Could you imagine hearing from God all those years ago about this Awana program and saying, maybe next time it comes around, I'll bring them. I don't think you would have been here last week baptizing your own grandchildren. Now, church... As we read on, we move into the naming of Jesus. It's found in Luke chapter 2, obviously, verses 21 through 24. It tells us, eight days later, eight days later when the baby was circumcised, he was named Jesus. The name given him by the angel even before he was conceived. Then it was time for their purification offering as required by the law of Moses after the birth of a child. So his parents took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. The law of the Lord says, if a woman's first child is a boy, he must be dedicated to the Lord. So they offered the sacrifice required by the law, by the Lord. Either a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now once again, church, there are several sermons in what we just heard. And I think I'm telling myself that more than you so I could stay focused on Jesus. Now in the Bible, it tells us something interesting here. And it's going to be important for us to remember this as we explore Jesus' life for the next several weeks. The Bible tells us that the baby, the baby was named Jesus. The name given him by the angel even before he was conceived. Now stop and think about that for a moment. Stop and think. Why the name Jesus? Why the name Jesus? Well, for one, etymolog etymologically speaking, it derives from Hebrew roots, which means Yahweh is salvation. Amen. That's a good, that's a good title right there. I mean, you think about it, out of all the names Jesus could have chose for himself, for all the titles that he carries, the name he chose to represent himself to all mankind was a name that, spoke, that in itself spoke of mercy, grace, hope, and salvation to a lost world. Jesus, although he is, does not want to be known as conqueror or king or anything else. He wants us, mankind, to know Him as the way to God, the way to salvation. Out of all the things Jesus is, by far the most important thing He is to us is our Savior. Because without salvation, we are all doomed. And when we die, we'll be eternally cut off from God. Remember, church, Jesus came to this world so that we can stand in God's presence and we could be in a right relationship with God. Jesus wants to give us life and life to the fullest, as we've heard many times now. And the only way to have that life to the fullest is not is not by letting Jesus just be our Savior, but it's also by letting Him be our Lord. Now today we're going to close with Jesus being presented in the temple. It's found in verses 25 through 35. At that time there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was a righteous and dev devout and was eagerly, eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day the Spirit led him to the temple, so when Mary and Joseph came out to present the baby Jesus to the Lord as the law required, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace as you have promised. 
have seen your salvation which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations and he is the glory of your people Israel. Now hold on a second church because all this you've heard before, right? I mean, I've preached this part before. But listen, look at what happens next. Jesus' parents were amazed at was what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and he said to Mary, the baby's mother, This child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall and many others to rise. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your very soul. And this is where we're going to close for the day. Now, church, as we explore the life of Jesus Christ, it might seem like it starts off a little slow. I mean, after all, right now in the timeline, Jesus is, in Jesus' timeline of his life, he's only 40 days old. Think of a baby that's just a little over a month old. They're cute. They're definitely precious. And they could teach you a few things off about life. But they start off slow. But just like with any child, they learn to crawl, walk, and then run. And once they're running, their lives and our lives become more exciting. And as we explore the life of Jesus, we'll see this process of crawling and walking and running unfold before our very ears as we learn more about who is this man? Jesus. And why did he come to this world? And what are we doing here? I mean, just as the disciples who walked with Jesus and knew him, they knew him personally. But nonetheless, they were terrified and amazed and asked each other, Who is this man? When he gives a command, even the winds and waves obey him. Just as they were amazed, and they were with him. Jesus' parents themselves were amazed at what was being said about this 40-year-old day, 40-day-year-old burnt baby. You ever been there? Yeah? I mean, you know Jesus personally. He is your Lord and Savior. You've been walking with him for quite a long time. And then you come out, come along and find something new. And all over again, God amazes you, right? It's a wonderful thing when he does that. But listen to this. Listen, both Mary and Joseph, both of them had an angel of the Lord appear to them in person and tell them all this already. I mean, Mary herself became pregnant while she was a virgin. And nonetheless, roughly nine months and 40 days later, they were still amazed. Why? Because the truth is we'll never know everything about this Jesus Christ that God sent to us. As the scriptures even say, Jesus did many other things. If every one of them were written down, I suppose there would not, the world would not have enough room to hold all the books that would be written. Listen, we will never know it all. But what we do know, at least what I know, is that living the way God intends for me to live here on this earth has given me a testimony that astonishes anyone who hears it. And living the way God intends for me to live on this earth has also given me the ability to go home at night and glorify and praise God for all that He's done. Because the truth is, it's not always going to be easy. We heard about that last week. I mean, even as we learn to crawl, as we learn to crawl with the Lord, we're going to run into sharp corners on the wall. Our hands are going to slip out from underneath us and our face will smack the floor. 
And it will hurt sometimes. But pay close attention to what God has told you here today. Because sooner or later, we're going to be walking. And then we're going to be running with the Lord. Amen? Amen. 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 Now before we close in prayer, for those of you listening online, or maybe even one of you sitting here today, I want to explain this whole salvation thing that God offers us through His Son, Jesus Christ. Because the truth is, without salvation, everything else is futile. See, the truth is, the truth is, you already know this. You know you're a sinner. You know you've sinned. And it's, and it's your sin that is, what, that is what caused a separation between you and God. And unfortunately, those that are separated from God will perish on this earth and then be eternally separated from Him forever. And God does not want that to happen. He doesn't want it to happen. That's why He sent His Son Jesus to pay the wages of our sins. And Jesus did so by giving up His life for us on the cross so that we can have eternal life with God. And all we have to do all we can do is come to God like a child comes to their parent and ask God to forgive us of our sins against Him. Ask Him to come into your heart and rescue you from this life that you do not want to live. And all of this is done in prayer, in communication with you and God Himself. Listen, if you're listening to this, it doesn't have to be an elaborate confession of everything you've done wrong in your life. It has to be a simple recognition to the truth that God loves you. He, doesn't, he wants to rescue you. And He's already told you the way. So if you're listening to this online, it doesn't matter if it's today or ten years from now, all you need to do is come to God and ask Him to forgive you. Amen? Amen? Let us close in prayer. Father God, we're not even worthy to speak to You. But because of what Your Son did for us, You've given us the opportunity to. And I thank You for that, Father. I thank You, Lord, for sending Your Son to this earth to be the author and the perfecter of our faith to be the example that we needed to be the man that none of us could have been. Father, I just thank You for this time we have on this earth. The time You give us to learn about You, to grow with You, and to be used by You. Father, we thank You for Your Son, Jesus, who's made everything possible. And it's by His name we give You all the glory, honor, and praise. Amen. 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 Rick?